Death Watch. All right, so we'll begin with a quote from H.P. Lovecraft himself. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. So our story begins in Arkham, Massachusetts, where, at the behest of the Society for the Expl Exploration of the Unexplained, you have met with one Mr. Stephen Knott. Mr. Knott, a landlord, has asked you to examine an old house in central Boston, known as the Corbett House. The former tenants, the Macario family, were involved in a tragedy, and the owner wishes to understand the mysterious happenings at the house and set matters straight. Mr. Knott has been unable to rent the house out since the tragedy and hopes that you can clear things up and restore its good name. He offers to reimburse you for your time and trouble. So you guys are actually in the Orn private reading room at the uh, Miskatonic University Library. And the one of the SEU secretaries brought you guys into the room to meet with Mr. Stephen Knott. So it's you three and one other guy. And so if you guys would like, if you have any idea of your description, you can give them now. Let's start with you, Brenna. Yeah. So... I am of average height with blonde hair, and I look probably, I look older than I am from all the hours spent outside working in the sun, and I smoke constantly. What's your name? Oh, my name is Vincent Newell. So what about Vincent um, makes him curious of the mysteries that you can discover here at the SEU. And those can be anything like they don't necessarily have to be the Lovecraftian sort. They could just be, like I said, like Egypt, like who built the pyramids. Um, well, sort of thing. I thought maybe he was a veteran of the First World War. Okay. And he just saw something that he couldn't explain. You know, some somebody like breathing mustard gas or whatever and right. not bothering them whatsoever. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, John. So my name is Joseph Thompson. I'm a, I don't know if it would be middle age at that point, but 34. I'm also a veteran. I was a pilot in the first world war. Uh, I'm uh, average height, uh, just dress pretty pretty neat and uh the thing that uh draws me to it was a uh when i was shot down in the war and uh just the what it took to survive um to get back to some civilization I was shot down over uh the uh france probably somewhere the yeah Arctic. You saw the northern lights, <laughs> so many colors. Sorry, Brandon, you said, what was your name, Vincent? Yeah, Vincent Newell. Okay. All right, Chris. Oh, um, guten tag. I am Herr Müller. I am a professor from Germany. The enemy. <laughs> I was not the enemy at the time. I there aren't any was. Nazis yet. So. Uh, I, I believe I was much too old to have joined during the war. Uh, I'm 75. I'm elderly, hunched. Occasionally, I smoke. Uh, I am bald with a close cropping of gray, white hair and a thin mustache. Rather dapper. All right. So there's one other guy besides Stephen not there with you. And he looks to be a Irish sort of fellow with red, a red mustache. Um, he actually holds up his journal, which he scrawled the name Finn McCraken in, and he shows it to you. And there's an explanation underneath that says, I am mute. Uh, Finn McCraken has an expression on his face like he's been searching for somebody for 20 years and has not yet found them. Um, he doesn't look like a big guy at first look, but when you look closer, you can see that he is. He has broad shoulders, but he kind of hunches them in. And he has huge hands. Yeah, but other than that, he sits quietly and, and listens to Stephen Knott's explanation. So if you guys would like to ask Mr. Knott any questions, now would be the time. 
So he thinks he has a haunted house on his hands. He doesn't believe it. He's gi- he's given that impression through the explanation of what has happened, mm-hmm. but he kind of says all the yokels back in Boston love a good spooky story. So you guys have some respect in the area. So if there was a report published by you guys and saying that this house wasn't haunted, then that would be great. So what's his connection to the house? Whose connection? Uh, oh, I'm the landlord. I own it. I recently inherited it, actually. I it was owned by my uncle. What's the name of the house? Uh, the Corbett house is what he called it. Here's a... Just a... Well, hold on a sec. Yeah, I just, I'm not making any money off of it, you know. As soon as a tenant... No of rent there is? Yeah, as soon as they see where it's at and they realize the association, the appointment's over. Mm-hmm. I see. I've been all around the world. I have not encountered one ghost. Don't worry. We will get Nor to the bottom I. of this. Um, but it would mean a lot, I think, if you guys were to do some research on it and uh, perhaps publish something in the Boston Globe or the Herald to the effect that it is not haunted that would greatly help me be able to sell it or rent it out again. Merely a uh, yokel superstition. Correct. I see. Wunderbar. And um, I, I'm prepared to pay you up front even $25 in advance. Okay, what's this guy's name again? Uh, Mr. Knott. Like K-N-O-T-T? Yeah. And who... Where did these rumors start? I don't really know the details. Like I said, it was an inheritance. Um, The only thing I can tell you is that the last family to live there, the Macario family, uh, there was something that happened that kind of gave everybody the impression. I'm not sure. Maybe there was a murder or, or something strange, you know. How long ago did they vacate? I think it's been a couple years. Um, I don't have my records right here. I, I think it was in 1917, maybe even further back than that. Do you have any contact information for the Macarios? Uh, no, I have no idea how they ended up. I mean, if it was a murder, you'd think it's probably in prison. But I don't even know that there was a murder. And then he's offering, you're offering $25 up front? Yeah, right today. If you guys drive to Boston and get started on this. I actually have renovators coming Friday to start in on the house. Is this the first time that you've renovated it? Uh, Yeah, like I said, I just recently inherited my, my uncle passed a few months back. Had you heard anything from him or any of his employees? No, I'm. I, I was actually surprised to be in the will. But our family is a bit of a dying tree, so. Aren't we all? Are you attempting to rent the home or sell the home? Depends on how I can make the most money, to be frank. Oh, I thought your name was Mr. Nutt. Mr. Nutt, Frank? Frank Nutt. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, well, so do we know each other? That's up to you guys to decide. You've probably I, seen me shuffling around. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that we probably all know each other, but don't acquaint often. Because we're all pretty disparate in our backgrounds. Um, you, so, uh, everybody drunk. takes turns speaking at these SEU meetings, so whether or not your character would have likely done that might also determine how well you know each other. I don't know if the professor up there had has given any well, lectures I on it. Well, probably anything. have as recently. Of, I've went to, I believe... Massachusetts as well right. recently and I've come back and unfortunately it was just uh, some young person unable to cope with his despair at a uncle who committed suicide. As so many of these SCU investigations turn out because you are the place that people turn to when the police are like haunted house? What, why would we even look into that? So, right. um, well, but yeah, he's like yeah, I got the $25 here and he pulls it out and uh, passes it off. Well, you guys do this all right shake so. his hand so you got a deal mr nut 
And he's like, if I get a favorable outcome on this, there's a bonus at the end. It's a moral dilemma for the salesman. Yeah. <laughs> Just tell him it was good. Um, there are no such thing as ghosts. So a favorable outcome is, is nigh. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Knott, thank you. All right. And uh, Finn doesn't ask any questions because he's a mute. But he does watch. Is he one of us? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's one of the guys. A secretary bought, brought you in here. You were the four selected to, to talk to Mr. Nutt. Cut, cut your tongue. Uh, I'm mute. He holds up the signing. <laughs> I'll squint. He says it, though. No, I'm mute. Uh, and then he holds it. Oh, <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> How um, much of our feed do we have to give to the society? None. Oh. Well, how do they make money? They don't. They're Donations. a university group. So yeah, I like... Uh, what is it like from Penny Dreadful, like the Explorers Guild? Yeah. Uh, so he also gives you a set of keys and okay. the address, which is 20 Sheaf Street. And we're in Massachusetts now. Uh, yeah, you're you're in Arkham, so you're about a few hours drive. Okay. From Boston. And I can have my truck. Yeah. I have my truck. Uh, Finn also has a car too, and he's happy to use his vehicle. He'll well, kind of he'll kind of follow like, you. Make a grunt and hold it up. Wait, oh, Finn. So what was your name? Arthur? Joseph. Okay, Joseph. Thompson. Thompson. Hang on. And here you guys go. That's just a recap of everything. You can go put that on your board and if you want. What was your name again? Johan Muller. All right, so since this is our first ever scenario... I'll give you guys a couple places to start. What was Finn's last name? McCracken. Nice. So when you guys get to Boston, if you leave now, you would arrive by midday. Okay. Um, knowing your jobs as part of the SEU, a few places you might want to start with are the offices of the Boston Globe, which is a newspaper of some repute. Uh, or you could head to the Central Library. Or you could go to the Hall of Records, which is kind of an analog to our vital records slash social security service. It just keeps birth certificates, death certificates, marriage licenses, you know, like church information, that sort of stuff. But the choice is yours. So we'll say you're actually sitting in a cafe when you guys arrive and discussing how best you want to conduct your investigation, assuming you left right away. All right, so you guys are sitting in the cafe. Um, just you've come here to take your lunch and determine how you would like to proceed in your investigation. Okay, well, I will volunteer to go to <coughs> the library. No, the Hall of Records. I can go to uh, the Boston Globe. I've got a, a war buddy works there <laughs> yeah. doable uh we can roll i gotta use some luck mm -hmm. <laughs> i think it would be a art craft journalism <laughs> is there a base rating for that five percent see if it happens so what you want to do is get five percent or less can we go on the high end mm -mm. Mm -mm. oh high is bad okay 43 all right so you you told those guys that, <laughs> but... But I really don't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Got Nothing a, a buck or two won't fix. And then should we meet at the at the Corbett house after each oh. of us have... Uh, you guys, he, he did set you guys up with a room in a hotel oh, or okay. multiple rooms. Uh, so one thing you want to consider is there are phones... But you call the operator first, and then they would connect you with the person, and there are wait times. So the best way to get a hold of somebody that you're not right in front of is by telegram. So a good practice is to, when you leave the hotel, tell the clerk that you're going to such and such place and to forward the telegrams there. Okay. So that way you guys can have some approximation of communication with each other. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess I will go to the library and see what I can find. On the house itself and the local history, uh, you can be able to reach me there. And uh, I guess uh, Herr uh, Newell wishes to meet at the house, so we meet there. I see no point in staying at some hotel. How are we supposed to find out if the house is haunted? 
unless you stay in it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. And with that, I'll like leverage myself up on my cane <laughs> and then start walking. And what was your guy's first name again, Chris? Johan. Johan. There we go. All right. Who wants to go first? Or do you just want me to pick somebody? Just do it in a circle. Yeah. All right. We'll go from left. We'll go clockwise. So, Brandon, you are going to the, the library. Hall of Records. Hall of Records. <laughs> All right. So, uh, this the streets Boston are it's rainy and whatnot. Uh, and there's you have the mix of horse and buggy and automobile oh, going okay. on still. Um, the Hall of Records itself looks like some ancient Eastern European castle. It is comprised of great, sturdy blocks of stone with peaked roofs at its four corners. Faux crenellation decorates the lip of the roof. You notice as you're walking into the main entrance that a man can be seen watching you from the uppermost floor. After a moment, he pulls the blind on the window down, blocking the view. Inside, the place is quiet and mostly deserted, as only a historian with the interest with an interest in the most dry aspects of Bostonian lore visits the Hall of Records. A clerk stands ready to direct you to the appropriate place to search. Yeah, so um, I'll ask the clerk to direct me to the appropriate place to sure. search. <laughs> so uh, for records on the Corbett House, right? So maybe like. Um, title transfers and, and right. whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Tax, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So um, the, real, the reality of this kind of search in this time frame is it takes up a lot of time. Yeah. So you're going to be spending until dinner time or longer for this one check. Okay. So how to make a check, since I didn't say it quite out, although we just showed it to John, is at this place you're going to be making a library use skill. Okay. So you want to roll that value or lower to succeed. Okay. Oh, man. That's What'd you get? 24. What's your value? 20. So, uh, like, I don't know if you want to do that, Travis, what? but, uh, like, it, you would say 24 over 20 over the base, over the skill that you have, right? right. So, like, if I wanted to shoot you with my gun, I'd roll, and that would be 41 over 40, so I'd miss there. But if I got under, I'd say, you know, like 38 under 40, meaning it's a hit. Oh, that'd be yeah. Good. So okay. say you roll over 24 over 20, your skill. And then if you know what kind of success that is, because that also factors in, you can say that's a regular success or mm. that's a hard success. For example, if you shoot somebody and you get an extreme success, you deal max damage plus an additional roll of that damage dice. Okay. That what are the. Uh... The it's dependent on your that. base so. skill. So the the skills also have the half and fifth values. You guys can fill those uh, out as you go. Um, okay, so what you can do is called pushing the roll. So you just say you're going to do something a little bit differently than you begin, like you're going to spend longer searching, for example. And then I would say, well, you'll miss dinner that way. You might go hungry if something were to come up and you don't eat again. Like, I would foreshadow the, the results of further failure. Okay. So, would you like to push the roll? Yeah, I'm I'm used to going hungry. Okay. It's a farmer. It's the 20. So, you get to roll again. Oh. Nice. Three under 20. That's really good. <laughs> that might even be an extreme success. So, how, what, how do you tell? Um, so your half and fifth values, a half, if you meet or get lower than that would be a hard success. So yeah, it is yeah. extreme because fifth would be four yeah. and I got three. All right. So you expected you had settled in to miss dinner and I will allow on the, since you got the extreme success that you actually made it in the time of a regular check. Oh, okay. Okay. So let me tell you what you got. Okay. So you found in civil court records, uh, you actually found a will for a Walter Corbett who was shown to be the owner of the Corbett house, right? Well, it, you make that association because the name's the same. So it shows that the executor of Walter Corbett's will was Reverend Michael Thomas, pastor of the Chapel of Contemplation and Church of Our Lord, Granter of Secrets. Um, you also saw in that church because you were interested if this Corbett who owned the Corbett house 
although it doesn't give the dates, was a member of that church, which he was, that that church closed in 1912. Oh, what was the name of the church again? Uh, the Church of, or the Chapel of Contemplation and Church of Our Lord, Grantor of Secrets. That sounds very Christian. So the last will and testament of Walter Corbett, Esquire. Walter Corbett Esquire lived from 1798 to 1866. His last will and testament was drafted in 1866 in the state of Massachusetts, county of Suffolk. Suffolk? Suffolk? Yeah, Suffolk. So I, Walter Corbett, of the county of Suffolk and state of Massachusetts, being in perfect health of body and mind, do make and ordain this my last will and testament in the following manner. The first... I give to the Chapel of Contemplation, Copps Hill, Boston, Massachusetts, all of my possessions, including my copy of, and interestingly, that's been redacted, and my property at 20 Sheaf Street in Copps Hill, which is the address of the Corbett House. The second, I direct my executor to lease my property at 20 Sheaf Street, using the proceeds to fund the church. Third, I wish my body to be interred in the basement of the property at 20 Sheaf Street, as specified by the instructions left to my executor. Fourth, I appoint Pastor Michael Thomas of the Chapel of Contemplation in Copps Hill, Boston, Massachusetts, as my executor to this, my last will and testament, this, the 17th day of July, A.D. 1865, signed Walter Corbett, Esquire. <clears throat> okay all right so that will take you from when you arrived there which was about an hour after you left the cafe until you start getting hungry and you would normally take your dinner so we will move on to johan at the library duh rummaging through some old books uh local histories maybe uh maybe clippings from newspapers from something uh much more recent all right so the central library on a monday afternoon is mostly there. deserted what? it is a squat said i had some pins laid out on the board if you want to put it up there oh, okay. so the length the central library is a squat building with two spires jutting from the peak of the roof the lower floor windows are small and rectangular while the upper floor windows are long and arched Inside, there are long shelves lined with many and varied books, new and ancient. The center floors are decorated with several writing desks with lamps, the kind with gold-rimmed green glass shades. Mm -hmm. No one greets you as you enter, though you can see a librarian pushing a cart between two bookshelves, pausing from time to time to place a book on the shelf. So this works very similar to uh, Vincent's mm -hmm. thing, where it's a library use and it will represent about half a day, like a working day yeah. of search. Yeah. yeah, humble establishment, but let's see if there's any gold here. Okay. Uh, 21 under 40. That's almost a hard success, but not <laughs> quite. All right. So you find your first hit on a news clipping. It's a, uh, it's the um, Friday, December 18th, 1835 edition of the Boston Daily Journal. And the article of interest states, Weber House sold. Successful local merchant, Henry Weber, has sold his recently completed Sheaf Street property to one Walter Corbett Esquire after falling ill recently. Mr. We Weber stated that he felt he would be unable to maintain the house and accompany an estate with his failing health. Mr. Weber only completed the house this past spring but neighbors are hopeful that Mr. Corbett will be a fine addition to the area. Oh, yeah, I'll blow out some uh, extremely pungent uh, English tobacco smoke and okay. uh, nod <laughs> over my finding. All right, Joseph, you head over to the Boston Globe. 
The Boston Globe is a gray, rectangular, seven-story building with the words The Globe in worked bronze lettering hanging over the arched doorway. The United States flag atop the building hangs limp in the sodden weather. Once inside, the lobby is quiet, though you can hear the faint rasp of a printing press from somewhere within. A businessman sits in the lobby on a red cushioned bench, reading the latest edition. The desk clerk, a bored looking red haired woman in glasses, gives you a manufactured smile as you approach her desk. Your attention is momentarily drawn away from the desk clerk by the clicking of the clicking sound of loafers on the tiled floor. It's just the businessman leaving with his paper tucked under his arm. May I help you? The woman says, her accent thickly Bostonian. Does she have a, uh, a nameplate on the desk? She doesn't. Oh. Is, uh, what type of day, what time of day is this? So this is early afternoon. Yeah. So I'll greet her with uh, good afternoon, ma'am. As I was uh, wondering if I could bother you to allow me to go through some of the past issues. Um, uh, in particular, I'm looking for information on a property at uh, 20 Chief Street or its uh, previous owners. She says, well, I don't have a problem with it, but it's not really open to the, uh, or she says the morgue, and it sounds like the mog, isn't uh, generally open to the public. You'd have to get permission from one of the editors. So could I... Uh, Charmer. I was going to do uh, more of a persuasion. So uh, what are you trying to do? Just to uh, see if she'll take you down there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, thirty-six over or under. Sorry, sixty. That's a hard success. Or okay. sorry, uh, no, it's a regular success. So the thing about persuasion is um, basically you're using like logic. Or a good argument. Oh, should I go fast talk instead? Uh, no, you. but it doesn't have to be beholden to the truth. It just takes oh. more time than fast talk. Persuasion is what you use if you have a little time. And in this case, since it's not busy, you could spend 30 minutes, you know, smoozing back and forth with this lady. And okay. you could stick with that success. So if, you, if that's what you want to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, if as long as she's not getting, uh, getting a lot of people in. Yep. So yeah, not many people come in and they don't talk to her. They seem to work there. And uh you kind of, are you like flirting with her a little bit, you think? Yeah. So what's the uh what's the lo the logic based argument of it though? Like what are you like what argument are you presenting? Uh kind of a the thrill of doing something that you know you shouldn't, right? Oh. Live okay. dangerously. All right. So yeah, she, she's totally into it. And you can see after a little bit, totally into you. She's not a very attractive woman, but she's not bad either. Um, and she says she'll do it, but there's a couple of things you have to come or you have to come back after the press is closed and you have to take me out somewhere. Nice. Treat me right. Deal, sweetheart. <laughs> All right. She's like, so I'll see you at six. You got it. That would be when the the press is closed. How are you for dancing? Looks like you got a set of gams for it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. All right. So it's about dinner time. And I wanted to note that the one success for you guys does not necessarily mean you exhausted the search at that place. But anyhow, you are, you are starting to feel the rumble of hunger pains in your stomach. At my age, we subsist on almonds and uh, buttermilk. It's <laughs> <There's> no... <laughs> so, Brano, it's all about the same time. Although, John, you do have some free time. That didn't take more than an hour okay. to get them up to uh, the same timeline as then. So, is there something else you wanted to do in the interim? Uh, did I find anything? Uh, or... No, you haven't gotten back. Yet. Oh, I haven't we gotten just... back there yeah. yet. Okay. Yeah, so you're just smoozing about town right now, killing time till your date. So I'm Murder not uh, really familiar with the area, so I'm going to try and get some information on a, a fairly nice place. 
not top of the line, but to rent, to own. Uh, no, to uh, take this girl. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. So you just want to maybe ask a passerby? Yeah. Hey, Sonny Jim, you happen to know what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> How do you talk? Are you more old fashioned? What are or are you uh, all for the slang of the era? Uh, not too much slang. Uh, enough to get by if you have to. Yeah. Have to talk to a person, sell to a person. That's uh. Yeah, on the the lower end, I try to target more uh, higher income, so a little more bit more proper. proper. So uh, you ask another fella that you pass that looks like he might be the sort to take ladies out to a nice place and he suggests a french restaurant called the marley of and he gives you some directions to it okay all right so back to you vincent you found that will yeah i um well so i want to see what i can find out about pastor michael thomas or the church sure so Um, chapel of contemplation Church of Our Lord, Grantor of Secrets. Yeah, so the church records actually don't require uh, a search since they're much smaller than like property records. Right. Uh, and you find it pretty quick. Like I said, it had closed, I believe I said in 1912. Yeah. Um, and it, there is a note in the church registry that there was some criminal action having to do with that church, but those types of records wouldn't be stored here. Right. Okay, and uh, so I can get that church's the address. Uh, yeah, it um, like the build. Like, can I look into the records of what happened to its building after it closed? Uh, it's it's not. They don't have that there, but they do have the address, which is actually in the Cops Hill neighborhood, where your guys's house is located. Okay. Instead of being twenty, it is forty-five Cops Hill. Okay. Well, that's all I want from here then. Okay. And what are your plans going forward? Well, we had agreed to meet at the, sh- the house, the Corbett house. This evening. So I'll... And did, what time is it Did now? you guys set a time? Just after we were done investigating. Oh, okay. Um, so it's it would be you push through the dinner. We'll put that at around 5 o'clock. So it's like 6 right now. It's getting yeah. closer to supper now. So, well, I'll head there, but I'll see if there's something along the way. Head to the house? To grab to eat, you know. Okay. Like a roadside vendor. Or a, yeah, you actually happen to McDonald's see... exist in 1920? No, not quite. You actually happen to see a... Uh... Have you not seen what McDonald's makes? Like uh, the pink slime? They <laughs> exist in all time frames now. <laughs> you pass a Doyle's Cafe yeah. and stop in for a bite. And that's all covered with your credit rating. Oh, okay. Okay. But then I'll head to the house. Johan. I will continue the search of the library, this time focusing more on uh, local history uh, the, of the land itself. It, well, the, is this an Indian burial ground? Are there any other uh, oh, on it. Okay. Uh, p- potential hauntings throughout the ages here? Library use. All right. 98 over... <laughs> uh, 40. All right. Uh, you um, you may push the roll in the same manner that Brandon did. However, you are going to be pushing into the night and likely past the time you would meet up with these guys. Because I assume you gave a general evening time frame. Yeah. Unless but, you're just all going to meet up whenever. Yeah. But I kind of, well, I, I don't know. I, I did hint that I wouldn't be staying at my room. Right. I'd be staying at the house, so... Oh, okay. They'll they'll be late, but... Okay, so you want to push through it? Yeah, right. I'll do it. 29 under 40. Okay, you do not find specifically what you are focusing for, but since you are searching further back, you do have another hit on that house. So, this is from the Boston Herald... Feb- or Friday, July 2nd, 1852. The headline reads, Neighbors Sue, 
Cops Hill area resident Walter Corbett Esquire has had suit brought against him by neighbors yesterday. Neighbors of Mr. Corbett are petitioning to force him to leave the area, quote, in consequence of his serious habits and inauspicious demeanor, end quote. Mr. Corbett has made no statement in response to the lawsuit. He resides in the Sheaf Street address he purchased 17 years ago. And at the end of that, it is late evening, 9 o'clock. All right. Well, the library's probably going to boot right. me soon. Yeah, that's the closing time. So, yeah, like I'll kind of look up from whatever sheaf of uh, newspaper clipping I was reading. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not notice how late it had gotten. And I'll begin to amble my way out into the street uh, and like uh, Vincent here. Try to find something to eat at this late hour. All right. Uh, Joseph, back to meet this this lady. Her name is... What's her name? Anita. Okay. So... So when you walk back into the Boston Globe, she's kind of like waving. She's like, come on, come on. You got to be quiet, though. All right. I'll follow her. Um... Do you need any type of like stealth? No. Okay. But she takes you down some steps uh, into a dusty basement filled with filing cabinets and stacked high with old newspapers and other assorted junk. Um, as you go down there, a thin man with a long, solemn face startles at your entry, dropping a file on the floor, which he scrambles to gather together. The whole room smells musty, and the boiler system in the corner gives out a lot of heat. And uh, she, Anita is chatting the whole time. And she's telling you a story about how you know the Boston Globe burned down in 1878. So if you're looking for anything further back than that, we don't have it. Okay. But she actually helps you. She's like, so what are you looking for anyways? Um, information about uh, a property on uh, 20 Sheaf Street. Oh, uh, she's like, oh, I heard about that. Some sort of murders or maybe the whole family got sick or something like that. Uh, I, I don't have much information on it, but, uh, yeah, the Macario family would be of interest, too. That was the last family that was there. Was that the name of the family? Yeah. She's like, well, here, I'll ha uh, we sort some of our uh, features by address, so I'll see if I can find it for you real quick. And she does, in short order, produce a draft of a feature store story that was never published. And the headline was, What Haunts the House in Sheaf Street? Monday, October 28th, 1918. Something sinister seems to haunt a local Boston house. Whatever it is has destroyed three families in the last 40 years. The two-story house at 20 Sheaf Street in the north end near Copps Hill has been the site of fear, madness, and death. <laughs> and possibly murder since before the turn of the century. In 1880, a family of French immigrants by the name of Ludo rented the property and moved in. What horrors happened to those people that year will never be known, save that a series of violent attacks of some kind left both parents dead and their three children crippled for life. The house stood vacant for almost 20 years, but in 1909, another family moved in. From the time they moved into the house, Mr. and Mrs. Jones fell prey to illness and sickness, almost as if the house itself were conspiring against them. Their children did not fare much better, though all of them lived in the house for several years. Their terror reached ahead when, in 1914, the oldest of the Jones children went mad and killed himself with a kitchen knife. The Jones family moved out after that, heartbroken at their loss. A third family rented the house in 1917, but left after less than a month when all of them became ill at the same time. Is the house haunted? Perhaps there is something wrong with the water, or some disease still lingers there from when it was built. In any case, anyone who dares live there now had better be brave and strong, for they take their lives into their own hands. <laughs> and so this, uh, this, this draft has a big red line through it. <laughs> and there's a note on top that says, Do not print. This speculation is beneath the globe. Okay. And that would bring uh, both of you guys all about to the same time frame, 9 o'clock. Okay. Well, after your date, of course. Yeah. 
okay. which you can you can roll. This is a combined skill. Uh, you can do your charm and appearance, and it only has to beat one of those. So it's really only against the better of the two. Mm. Mm. So. 92 over 60. <laughs> All right, so it, it kind of seems like it, after she helped you and you guys go to this uh, French restaurant, uh, suddenly like she clams up and she's not talking and you can't get anything out of her at first. You may push the roll if you have a good idea of how you want to do it. But she does look like the sort that might slap a fellow if things go wrong. No, I, I'm not going to push my luck with it. Um, I'll, uh, at the end of the evening, I'll, I'll uh, thank her for helping me and uh, note that, or make a uh, comment to her that uh, next time will be better when she, when we're not so tired. Okay. Um, she doesn't bother to, to be like, send me a telegram or yeah. something, whatever you say at the end of the day. <laughs> But yeah, it's all about the same time. Okay, so you guys head to the Corbett house? Yeah. So the neighborhood surrounding the Corbett house called Cops Hill is mostly new offices and apartments. The Corbett house itself being the sole exception. Um, the Corbett house is distinct amongst the other buildings, like a drop of blood on a blank white sheet of paper. The brick building is overshadowed by taller, newer office buildings on either side. Access to the rear of the house exists on either side of the residence. Studying the house, the observer is impressed by the way the house seems to withdraw into the shadows cast by the flanking buildings, and how the blank curtain windows hide all understanding of what lies within. Um, so you guys are actually across the street in the way that you traveled there. Um, we'll say that... Joseph was likely to arrive first since his date didn't go well. Mm. And then you guys arrive shortly after that. Joseph, you're standing there getting a look at the house. And uh, there's also a guy standing outside of a shop smoking a cigar. Uh, he's got like the newsboy hat on or whatever. And he's just sitting there looking at it while he's smoking. He's standing in front of what looks like a uh, cigar and newspaper shop. So um, when then these, these guys come strolling up a little bit later. You pass the time taking a nip off of your... <laughs> yeah, if I can do it uh, discreetly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it is prohibition, but yeah. there are still means. Yeah, I have a, a flask that I yeah. carry around. and Yeah, most uh, polite society has gone to their homes, and there are a few people on the street. So you're all a chance to talk to that guy? You could if you want. Yeah. You have some... Uh, um, how long has he been there? Um... Well, he's, you can see that he's closed up shop. So yeah. he's just standing out there and he's probably going to smoke his cigar before he presumably goes on somewhere else. How long has his shop been there? Oh, you're, oh, you're talking to him directly? Yeah. Okay. Long as I've been here, I had it before the war and after. I'll, uh, light a cigarette and ask him, you know, uh, what he's heard about the, the house and just gesture with the oh that corbett house yeah it's haunted everybody knows that <laughs> no haunted like what well not haunted like ghosts you know that would be silly but haunted in the sense that people are haunted you know what i mean like everybody who lives there they get sick or they end up killing each other or something so did you were you around when the uh that last family was here oh yeah i yeah. saw the fella come out the house waving a, a cleaver i didn't see the second part happen but he got down the road and i guess he stuck it in the arm of a mailman or something before they hauled him off i heard that he tried to kill his whole family i heard his whole family tried to kill him <laughs> so um, when they moved out was he still around or did they lock him up oh yeah they got him up in roxbury sanitarium him and his wife as for the kids, I think they sent them down Baltimore way. Uh, you say the wife's uh, out there. What happened to her? Well, on account of her husband trying to kill her and her kids and her being all alone in the house where that happened, I guess she kind of went a little bonkers too. Yep. Can I get you a cigar? Sure. 
So he takes the keys out, opens the shop back up, and he, he grabs your cigar and lights it up for you. Well, uh, thank him, and I'll uh, just, you know, kind of uh, small talk with him uh, while I wait for the others to arrive. Yeah, he tells you some other things. He says, yeah, it was the Macarios, I think was the name of the family. Um, before that, he tried to kill his wife and kids. I guess he fell out of his window, broke both of the legs. So he was up in the hospital for a while there. And then when he comes back, he starts going crazy. If you ask me, I think they put him on some experimental drugs. Of course, I got no way of proving that. That's just my thoughts on the matter. All them head shrinkers these days. Yep. Ain't got no business delving that deep. Exactly. Disembodied voice from nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you around uh, uh, right around the uh, uh, what would it be uh, family before that? Um, Nineteen fourteen. Uh, no, about. no. Uh, well, but nothing happened that I saw or heard. They just got sick, I guess, and then they moved. As I'll, uh, I'll relate the, uh, a story about the son, uh, committing suicide there. Ask him if he heard anything about that. No, I think that one's a pretty old one from like 18 something. He says, well, I heard that every family that's lived here, something like that has happened. I don't know all the details. See, I went a, a, away for a little while after the Macario incident, you know, to, to serve overseas and, kind of lost touch with the history of it but i do know most folks still think it's ha haunted you see kids come up here and try to get in there every now and then but they always spook themselves and run off good for them i say i'll tell you what that place reminds me of reminds me of france you see that gas come rolling over the trenches just gives me that feeling you know what i'm talking about did you mention that you sir yeah i'll uh i'll mention that as I tell them as that uh, uh didn't spend much time on the ground but Seeing it from the sky was something I'll never forget. And at this juncture, Vincent and Johan walk up to see him talking to this. He had said his name was Mr. Dooley. Uh, oh, I'll shamble over to him. Ah, uh, Thomas. And uh, who is your friend here? <laughs> I'll introduce him. He just overrides you and he's just like, Mr. Dooley. Mr. Dooley, a pleasure. Does I, his uh, demeanor change? <laughs> German, are you? Ain't that a shame. <laughs> thought we killed all you bastards. Oh, no, we are a vile bunch. Don't, don't mind the hun. <laughs> right. <laughs> we are most, uh, most hearty and pervasive. Uh, I think that is the word. <laughs> well, he stays polite, but you can see he has some distaste for you, Johan. Let's well, see if he if I can make it better or sure. worse. <laughs> oh, I fail. Uh, Forty two over thirty. Charm. Yeah, thirty five. Like, why don't you keep that slick German talk to the other German folk? <laughs> well, I apologize. I will leave you two to your discussion. <clears throat> well, uh, shake his hand, tell him it's a pleasure, and ask if he's closed up shop. Like, uh, yeah, I'm fixing to head home for the night. If you guys like, I suppose I have a couple cigars for you, even for the hunt over there. Does, do you sell cigarettes? Yes, sir. I'd like a pack of cigarettes, please. All right, I can open Did they make them? Yeah. Yeah. They're okay. filterless, I think, though. Yeah. No, thank you. I prefer English tobacco. <laughs> and then I'll uh, sort of segue. Well, ain't that a shame? <laughs> To, uh, a shame say. that they're wasting it on your cigars, yes. <laughs> uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Foul things they I'll are. I'll see if, uh, if he's heard. I'll say, um, have you heard of the church, the, the um, Chapel of Contemplation? It's supposed to be round here. Yes, sir, I have. Uh, in fact, it's just a few blocks up that way. You can walk down there in no more than an hour or so. It's just a bunch of ruins, though, these days. Yeah, I had heard that, that it was not not open anymore. When did that happen? Um, closed down 1912. There was some suspicion at the time that they were kidnapping children, but I don't know if that's like this house. Ghost stories, not to be believed, but... 
So you never heard any rumors beyond that about the church? No. Um, like I joined up in 1914, hoping they'd send us over sooner. I was one of the ones who wanted to go over there from the beginning. Mm. You know, Now that we went there, everybody's happy we were there. But before, it wasn't like that. And he get, kind of gets sidetracked talking about it. True enough. <laughs> um, but he's like, yeah, so I kind of lost touch with the neighborhood as I was doing training and whatnot. And then I went active in 1918, and I did my tour in France. St. Mihiel, in fact. Me too. Same place? Yeah. What outfit were you in? The outfit of... I don't know. That. Yeah. <laughs> you listed off in, in a suitably having yeah. served away. And he's like, well, hey, the cigarettes are on me today. Well... And um, the cigars work, too. <laughs> okay. So I'll gather that um, this is a local... He knows something about the local history. Yeah, and, a little bit. Um, just going off the assumption that we're not like some sort of secret agency and we don't need to worry about talking about this stuff then i'll mention that i found a connection between the church and the corbett house and i'll mention this just to him as well but to my companions there that it was um the the corbett house was um let me see if i can remember uh, a man named walter corbett bequeathed the house to a pastor named, or a reverend, Michael Thomas, from the Chapel of Contemplation, Church of Our Lord, G Granter of Secrets. And if that's not a mouthful, I don't know what is. Where I'm from, churches are just called First Church, Church of Christ. So maybe it was one of those weird churches that you hear about in big cities. And uh, so the guy's name was Walter Corbett Esquire which is a $5 name. And he, he granted the, the house to this church and said his body was to be interred in the basement of, of the Corbett house when he died. So I'm assuming he's buried there. I'll ask uh, our friend, Mr. Dooley about that. Do you hear anything about that? Uh, well, can't... that happened in 1866. Ah. Yeah. Like he, he says he knows it's he recognizes the name Corbett, but that's just what everybody in the neighborhood always called the house. He never knew no Walter Corbett. Hmm. So if it was given to this church, was, uh, how did Mr. Knott end up with it? Well, the priest gave it to him, right? Isn't that how what was said? Uh, he said his uncle gave it to him hmm. in his will. Well, I do know the church was shut down, and I couldn't find any information except a note about that church that there was some sort of criminal activity that had to do with it being shut down. But And the central records wouldn't keep something like that. That would be kept in a higher court yeah, that, or a police station or something. Yeah, we would have to dig more into that, but some criminal activity. Uh, maybe we ought to look into uh, uh, Bill Cell or... Uh, deed transfer um from after that church shut down yeah well that's a good idea but i think i might want to take a walk down to that church and just take a look around see if we see anything interesting they might have some old records or something there not a bad idea um uh newell newell yeah uh, newell i'd very much like to at least get away from here so do we have flashlights? Did they exist in 1920? Lanterns. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because it's dark now. You right? guys can or either get, there. Uh, get them. Um, actually, it might be kind of hard if you didn't happen to write them down. But okay. you're a farmer? Yeah. It might be something you think about. You could go ahead and put it in your gear and possessions. Okay. You always keep one in the truck. Yeah. Because you got to drive off, go check the well or something like that. All right, so are you all going to walk down to the... Yeah, I'll uh, yeah, is, bid um, Mr. Dooley a good night. What is... Uh, Thank him for the cigar. He says, yeah, you all take care. Finn. Stay out of that house. It ain't ghost haunted, but it ain't good either. What is Finn Coffee doing? Scene. Uh, what's his name? Dooley? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dooley? Yeah, take care. <laughs> Come on, boys. Sorry, let's go ahead, blast. Brandon. Sorry, I don't <laughs> Yeah, all right. 
I was just asking what Finn is doing. Oh yeah, NPCs. Oh, so yeah, he has been. Um, he actually went. Good thing he's mute, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you guys, if you allowed him to drive you all down, <clears throat> then he, he took his car, which is a. It's actually a pretty nice car. It's a 1920 Talbot. Hmm. So it's imported, but it's one of those longer, uh, four door, yeah. big old boats. So if you all took that, then he was driving you guys around. Although oh, when yeah. you, you split up, he would have went with anybody who was uh, oh, yeah. amenable was nice to having car. him along. So maybe he went, being the most simple person of the three of you, he probably just tagged along with you, Joseph. Or yeah. sorry, uh, Vincent, if yeah. you would have him. Absolutely. And he kept like a vigilant watch when you were at the Central Records. And, okay. And you kind of got like a sense when you're just watching him look at people that he like looks at every single person. Right. You know, like he doesn't just glance over anything. So. Hmm. Yeah, I have a friend like that. Um, so what do you say, fellas? You want to drive down there? We can hop in my truck or take a walk. Oh. It might be nice to see walking through the streets of the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, Especially as we get closer, if there's anybody but I'll, I'll make like out a, and about. You know, like a surreptitious, hmm. you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah, the Muns are used I to can, staying still for years. I can make this walk. I've seen most of the city on foot already. Let's go. Okay. Uh, so, I will leave you young with a snapples in the dust if you... <laughs> Let's just go. <laughs> uh, I'll get my lantern. Okay. And my... Uh, well, I have a 50 caliber machine gun. Mm. Makes sense. That I got from the war. It's 1920s. <laughs> you just the brought, you so do you have like yeah. a, a Browning yeah. automatic yeah. Uh-huh. rifle? Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, McCracken drives you guys up there and it is a short drive, maybe five minutes in the car. And uh, uh, you guys pull out in front of these this ruined structure, and he goes around to the trunk and he actually grabs out a lantern too. And um, you guys can all make spot hiddens while you're standing out there. And I also told you if you I forgot to tell you if you, if you succeeded on a skill, be sure to put a check next to it. You only have to do it one time, but when we're done here and if you're still alive, you get to roll to improve it. <laughs> I like that. If you're still alive. <laughs> Uh, 49 over 45. Okay. 99 over... Ooh. 50? I'm still a little bit steamed at that... Mr. Dooley? Yeah, that horrible American. <laughs> 53 over 45. All right, so if you guys want, you may push the roll. Like I said, I just need some reason. I can give you a suggestion. It would be leaning in closer and maybe alerting uh, this McCracken to what you're spotting. Right. Instead of staying hidden and just spotting it when he opens the truck. Oh, I'm more than willing to lean in. I'm even a nosy old man. Right. I saw I'm lighting my pipe. And oh, I'll, yeah, no, not me. I'll uh, take another ah, swig off the flask while everybody's occupied. 52 over 50. Uh, okay. I failed because I was lighting a cigarette with a match. Yeah, so I'll be like uh, kind of puffing on my pipe and kind of like leaning in. Just I'm not trying to hide it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm curious. So yeah, you see there's the normal spare tire, jack, all that sort of stuff in there. Um, and when you're leaning in, just kind of curious of what he's got, he kind of looks at you and he, he's like... Yeah, I, I, <laughs> if he's not saying anything, I'll, uh, I'll kind of just keep staring into the, just the trunk. Just speak what yeah, you I feel, mean. man. <laughs> yeah, right. he should have told me to stop. Well, he'll, I'll be kind of also like, you know, adjusting my glasses, trying to get a good look in. What'd you say? You got 39? Oh, no, I got, I got Did over. You fail again? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you just don't, don't see it. Yeah. All right. So, what is left of this old church stands at the end of a crooked, dingy street. The ruins are so weathered and overgrown with greenery that the gray stone rubble seems more like natural stone than former walls and foundations. You pass a slumping wall bearing white painted symbols, apparently freshly swabbed. Three Ys arranged in a triangle so that the top element of each Y touch the other two Ys. In the center, so created, is painted a staring eye. This is fresh? Apparently fresh. Looks like that. You may Hmm. take that. Uh... 
I'll ask uh, Hans if he's uh, if he's ever come across anything like that before. It's Fritz. Fritz. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is well, most definitely not Fritz. Uh, <laughs> I was going to call him Herr Mueller, but I don't even know if that's his name or not. Yeah, Herr Mueller. He's the Hun. Uh, so what would you want me to roll? I got history and archaeology. Sure. Well, I also so. have a cult, I believe. No, I don't. A cult 45. I got a cult 1911 for you, Hun. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, a cult is what you would roll if you want to go. To I something. don't have it. Uh, do you have a base skill in it? Uh, base skill is like five. You can try it. Mm. Use all your. How do you use luck? So the way luck works is if let me give you an example. Say you're tearing out of a place because somebody's got their Tommy gun on you, and you jump into a stranger's car. You would roll luck to determine whether or not the keys are somewhere in the car or not. Oh, okay. Or if you were jumping out of a second story <laughs> window. You might roll luck to determine how soft the fall would be. Okay. So, and mm-hmm. there's an optional rule, but we're not going to use it. I do one. have a cult. It's at sixty. I didn't write it down. Yeah. Go. What'd you roll? I said it's at sixty. Oh. All right. <laughs> Seventy-three over sixty. Can I push it? Uh, do you have a good idea of how you might push it? Let's see. We're looking at the. It's on a wall. Yeah. I'll kind of like. Uh, like starts you know scratch my head and i'll walk up and i'll kind of start uh maybe running my fingers over the various sigils or whatnot trying to jog something in my memory maybe sure. it's hard to see what exactly might be on the surface of that wall though as you approach it i'll uh i'll can i have him have the uh mutie bring some light over yeah he's got his, okay. his lantern right there 13 under 60 dang that's one away. Well, it's a... Uh, yeah, that's almost extreme. Yeah, it's a hard success on that. Yeah. Isn't it? All right. Yeah, you, did, you you realize you've had this symbol described to you uh, before. And as you're searching back in your memory, you realize that it was um, a guest speaker at a SEU meeting uh, that was years ago. You don't quite remember his name, but he actually talked about various death cults um, across the world and he described this symbol although he did not have a picture of it to you yeah so i'll be kind of like uh running my hands across it and puffing on my pipe and i'll go like uh, i seem to recall once uh i was at some sort of seminar a various occult history uh, cults and whatnot throughout uh, the ages, and a man described to me a symbol of a death cult, and I believe he was describing uh, the, the, the symbol. Can I write on this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. But I cannot be sure. And a death cult, to be clear, is a cult that um, believes that sacrifice will give them some benefit. Yeah, it does. Uh, the Mayans, the Aztecs, yeah. uh, Satanists in the heart of your dreaded South uh Moloch. and the such uh, well do you happen voodoo. to remember the name of this uh of either the the speaker or the uh cult the cult's name was handout nine mm. <laughs> <laughs> i've heard of them before uh you, uh you don't he gave uh there was one cult he mentioned that was it was called the cult of the bloody tongue but he actually had a picture of that cult symbol that they often use, and it was not this one, but that's the name that you can recall at this time. But you know, maybe maybe it was the cult of starry wisdom. Maybe it was something like that. Uh, the cult of uh, the one death cult is much like the other. They're very uh, creative at some things, but lack total imagination and everything else. Uh, but uh, the cult of the bloody tongue is one. Uh, uh, the cult of the sapient stars or some such. Who knows <laughs> what they get their head up to. But uh, I am sure. And I'll kind of tap it with my cane. <laughs> Very odd to be in uh, such a church. But then again, this church itself sounds odd. Well, didn't Mr. Dooley say there were rumors of children being kidnapped? Yeah. By this church? 
by the church itself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the rumors. I'm sorry. I could not listen when that uh, shy's hound was uh, <laughs> talking. Oh, uh, yeah. He didn't like you, did he? No, no. he did not. A uh, bad name for all Americans. Everyone else has been most kind to me since <laughs> I came here. So there are more of the grounds to explore if you guys wish. But Finn holds up one finger before you move on. And uh, he goes back to the Talbot and, and he goes back in the trunk and comes out with a boxy contraption that you soon realize is uh, uh, a camera, right? Oh, and yeah. he. Uh... Ah, of the portable <laughs> variety. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's pretty big. <laughs> yes, yeah, he, yes, he, the yeah, portable he... variety. <laughs> and he takes a picture of the, Good. Of the symbol. And so there's this big blinding flash and your night vision is ruined for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do want to walk around. I have my lantern, so I want to walk around. Is there anything of the building left standing? Um, no, it's just the walls and uh, foundations. Um, but you can see signs that it's destruction. It was burned in the past because there are a bunch of, you know, like... Uh, black timbers right. and sooty stones um and as you as you guys proceed across the grounds you get a, a, a sort of a slight tingle in your temples and forehead almost like a headache's coming on do do we know what the address here is it was i it's, believe i gave it to it, yeah it's 45 45 cops hill like uh, Cops of Trees? Right, Cops Hill, yeah. So, if I could get a luck roll from each of you. And those works the same? Yeah, so you want to roll oh. at your luck or less. Or less. Yeah, okay. it's always or less. Unless otherwise, no. Right, case. there are a few things. Like... <sighs> <clears throat> 94 over 60. 52 under 80 nice uh 73 over 60 okay so you two failed um vincent you just happen to be in a different part i mean you're not Joseph. out of out of sight or anything but you and uh finn were just looking at something else so i guess we are teamed up <laughs> walking yeah. around the grounds you're in the general area or together where this occurs but at some point you become aware that the earth that you thought it was earth you were standing on is actually weakened floorboards that are just so overgrown with moss and stuff that it gave that springy earth feel. And uh, at any moment, in fact, it could be this moment, mm. they could give out from under you. So if you'd like to, you could attempt a jump roll to <clears throat> leap to a safe area. 20% chance. Could I use uh, psychology to get in their heads? <laughs> you don't want to jump. Out. Just stay. <laughs> What's your psychology at? I'll... 60. Uh, he's better than me. <laughs> Salesman psychology. Yeah. Makes exactly. sense, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it might as well, right? Yeah. Forty-seven over twenty. Fifteen on the twenty. <laughs> Good job. All right, so you kind of make a uh, almost like maybe not dainty, but it's almost like one very determined hop to like a stone part of the, the wall. You know, uh, Brandon, you could push the roll if you want. It's up to you. I mean, you feel it like as soon as you realize that it starts breaking away. He hops to a safe place. Yeah. Uh, you, if you push, you could probably um, make it make the jump if you succeeded and grab a hold of the ledge but you're definitely not going to jump to safety with that push it's up to you um well no no i'll just accept my fate all right so you fall roughly 10 feet into what must have been an old basement area of yeah. this church and you take 1d6 points of damage go ahead and roll your damage two okay so you did if you had that number circled you can erase it and put it at the you know two less so luckily you did not suffer any major wounds in that fall okay um in order to suffer a major wound what's your hit points 11. you'd have to take six or more points of damage in one hit okay 
Is that uh, loud enough for me and Finn to hear that? Oh, yeah, you guys all heard it. It's a great crash. Okay. We, I'm going to head over that way. Yeah. And you just, I mean, you kind of look at the floor give way. You're standing right on the edge yeah. and you see that. Yeah, so I'll be like leaning on my cane and have one hand on my hat. And I'll be like breathing heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Herr uh, McCracken, uh, uh, Newell has fallen through the floor. <laughs> I'll uh, inch as close as uh, it as feels safe and uh, call down to Vincent, see if he's all right. And you are all right, Vincent. Or, yeah. Besides, that would be like some... Good bruising on the um, the point of impact where you fell. Well, I'll say. Hang on. Just finding the slang for the era. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll say yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, so Vincent, you've fallen into a part of the basement that was sealed off from the rest, originally reached by separate stairs, uh, now buried under tons of rubble. Within this room, next to a cabinet, are two skeletons dressed in tattered silk robes. Perhaps they hid from something down here and got stuck in the fire that destroyed this this building. Make a sanity roll. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 85 over 80. So you lose 1d3 points of sanity. So roll your d6 and 1 and 2 is 1. Okay, one. All right, so you make an involuntary action. You can determine what that would be likely for your character, or I can decide for you if you want. <laughs> so I lo- I go, I, my insane, or my sanity score goes down? Down to uh, one. one point. Okay. So do you have flashbacks of the war? As I jump into a... Uh, yeah, you know, uh, like that, that can be part of it. Skeletons is, in there? As you haven't seen a skeleton besides vermin right since the war and uh you know you that was something maybe you thought you'd put behind you even though i suppose it was only like two years ago yeah year and a half but you just weren't expecting to see a skeleton or two okay in boston so it kind of brings you back there but anyhow you make so to give you an example of why you make this thing is if you were trying to be quiet and you get scared this would be like your Lord have mercy, right? Your, your <laughs> yes. twitch or yeah. your jump. Or maybe it could be something embarrassing if you want, like you that, cry like a girl. It yeah, doesn't want to be like a shrill. Okay. So uh, you guys hear this <laughs> shriek. <laughs> this shrill shriek as though a little girl had fallen into the basement instead yeah. of a solid farmer. <laughs> I ask, uh, I <laughs> ask uh, what's his, Gil? What's his name? McCracken. Finn. McCracken? Yeah, Finn, if he's got any rope in his... In his vehicle. So his eyes light up and he holds up one finger. Were you carrying the lantern? <laughs> you did have a lantern. Yeah. Does uh, What are the chances of it breaking? Luckily, if you had pushed it, that would have been okay. the, the <laughs> fail. Luckily, you managed to keep it upright yeah. enough not for, for it not to shatter or spill too badly. So he comes back a little while with a rope. But anyhow, yeah, like I said, you saw the two skeletons next to a cabinet. Other than that, it seemed like the rest of the basement was oh. closed off. I, th- I think I'll call down, you know, keep them talking, you know, like, yeah. what? what's wrong, Annual? <laughs> There's two skeletons down here, sure. dressed in some kind of robes. And who else is down there with you? I think I heard some uh, Fraulein. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a nice subtle you burn You yourself a <laughs> name down there. <laughs> uh, such a horrible scream, did <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what that was. Oh, perhaps it was just uh, harmonics. Was wind. Yeah. yeah, wind or harmonics. Uh, skeletons. Uh, uh, well. So there's a cabinet? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just look in there. Okay. Yeah, there uh, there are um, church-type things in there. So like chalices and right. candles. But go ahead and make a spot hidden for me. Does it look like this, from what we can see upstairs or up top there, uh, does it look like this part was touched by the fire? No. Okay. Perhaps Although they a, likely would have perished from the heat. Another way around? Uh, 12 under 45. Uh, we'll wait so hard uh, success. Finn gets back with the rope. All right, so you notice a, a slim journal and a much larger tome stashed underneath the cabinet. Yeah, we'll grab them. All right. Found something. 
So, what did you find, Arnul? Just a couple of books, it looks like. Books? <laughs> eh? Yeah, this is wonderful. Cat um, in the Hat. Uh, <laughs> I have never heard of that. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> when did Dr. It's Seuss a tome. <laughs> she has one heck of a story he wrote. I'm glad they shortened it. Well, it's because if you read all of his works together, uh, you go insane. But broken up, they're safe. Okay. <laughs> see. So Finn returns with his rope and okay. starts. How deep am I? Ten feet. Yeah, I'll stand to the <clears throat> side and kind of, uh, there you go, Er uh, McCracken. <laughs> oh, yes, a hearty tug on the rope. <laughs> well, I'll toss the uh, the books up then. No, no Before no, you no. do that, they do seem to be in a, a bad way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nine, 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 do not toss the books. <laughs> they are precious tomes. Um, I could uh, have you, like, time up in my jacket if you want. We can also we can assume that you have a satchel if you'd like that you yeah. can carry them in. Uh, yeah, I'll just put them in there, climb out with the rope. Are you? I get the feeling that you're dressed as Indiana Jones right now. Yeah. Here's Brandon Bain. Nice. What is your climb skill? But with overalls. Yeah. <laughs> 20. That's enough to make it up. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, because you rope overalls and you're just and up the wall and he's pulling. With... So when he, he gets you up the there, when you got your hands over the edge, he uh, McCracken grabs you by the shoulder and helps you the rest of the way up. Okay. I'll, I'll give my hand with it too. Yeah. Or support the rope back at the uh, knot just in case. Yeah, you feel the strength of McCracken as he pulls the rope up. He's an ox. Aren't all of his Could have people? used a couple <laughs> of boys like you back in the war. He nods his head. What next? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you. I would like to uh, look at them books. <laughs> I'm left staring into the void that is uh, Finn's mouth now. <laughs> he might have a tongue. He's just mute. Oh, did he just open his mouth? Yeah, showed me his lost. tongueless. Uh... All right. Uh, so, Johan is asked to look at the books. Ah, she said you found books. Yeah, I'll pull them out. So it was one slim journal and a tome, a thick tome. And they're both in sort of a bad way. Uh, with uh, a kind of a shaky hand, I'll reach out and I'll take the journal from his hand. <laughs> and begin flipping through it real quick. All right, so the musty old journal, like just the opening up that you can feel that one first page just sort of tear free like it were a Shadowrun book. And uh... <laughs> Oh, come on. I'm, uh, I'm like working the library all day. That's like, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're careful, but it's book. like in really bad shape. So oh. it's just like the top of it kind yeah. of comes unglued this is very old <laughs> but you can see that the uh the name scribed at the front of the journal was that pastor's name was it thomas uh pastor michael, michael thomas yeah. reverend michael thomas yeah michael thomas <laughs> and much of the writing is obscured but just to, through a cursory uh flip through your name or you happen to catch the name Walter Corbett and that entry records in Reverend Thomas's words that Walter Corbett was indeed buried in his basement according to his will and in accordance with his wishes and the wishes of that one who waits in the dark as for the enormous volume uh, looking at the cover you can see scribed on it are the words Liber Ivanus, or Liber Ivanus. Who was and, buried in the basement real quick? Was it Weber, or was it uh, Col? Sorry, say that again. Who was buried in the basement? Corbett. Corbett. I think with your stuff, Corbett bought the house from Weber, and then he was sued by his neighbors for an unspecified reason, for his serious, like, manner or something like that. Inauspicious what, habits. What was the uh, inscription on the tome? Uh, Liber in Ivanus or Liber Ivanus. Sorry, my. And just opening it, you can see right away. It's. Mm. Uh... No, I will not open such a tome. <laughs> no, I, I'm open. He's got the journal. I'm yeah. Open oh, okay. You, you'll... Okay. So, um, what languages do you speak? Just English, probably. Yeah. So for for your language, it's equal to your education. And it's just your one. So if you guys didn't pick one, you just have English. 
but so how you many may do roll you get? a note just unless you got a different skill. Like I think Chris has a couple or Johan has a couple because of his occupation. I have German and English. Um, but you may roll what's called a no roll, and that is just an education roll. So go ahead and do that, Brandon, since you're the one looking at it. Or, sorry, Vincent. 84 over 50. So, yeah, it's uh, it still uses whatever our alphabet's called. Or, right. like, it looks mostly like our alphabet, right? Okay. But the word, it's all a jumble. So right. I, I will say, you know, like, uh, it would seem that this is the Journal of Reverend uh, Thomas. And he speaks and says that uh, Mr. Corbett was indeed buried in the house mm. according to the wishes of uh, himself and uh, whatever pagan god they worshipped it would seem oh weird yes <laughs> so everybody's getting sick that's in this house as that reminds me of the stories of you uh, you trench boys getting sick from all the disease in those uh, the trenches during the war what do you think yeah, it could be just a rotten body in the well, whatever, hmm. from the water. I don't I don't know what kind of sickness you get that makes you take a cleaver to your family, but I'm not a doctor. Yeah, there's all, all sorts of uh, discoveries being made every day. And uh, it could just be psychotic breaks, such things, such horrors that happened in the war. Did you say the inscription out loud or read it silently? Well, I didn't re say it out loud. Okay. Uh, but I would prefer to get out of this place unless we wish to continue investigating. Uh, but what but, time is it? Uh, no. uh, Finn gives a big soundless yawn. Hmm. Well, I need to get my foot elevated anyway. Yes, I, I was going to think about staying in the house, but if there is some sort of... Uh, uh, disease? No, not disease. Uh miasma that permeates the air and there that perhaps uh, our rooms at the hotel will be better yeah uh if you wish i can study the book in my room while sure. you... yeah so right. if you can make heads or tails of it <laughs> i will try i will try so what how is first aid used in this is it like uh an immediate care or long-term yeah. care it can or... restore one hit point okay oh, also you can uh, was it restore sanity too, right? Uh, that's a psychoanalysis. Yeah. Um, I'll tell Vincent that I can take a look at that. Take a look at his uh, his knee or foot, whatever. So okay. if I got that right, you guys are going to return to your hotel then. Yeah. yeah. All right. When you walk in the lobby, there the uh, clerk has a telegram for you. For who? For all of you, oh. or for whoever you know. It was addressed to each of you. Um, it's from Mister Knott. It says. Renovators arrived early. Stop. Um, they say you can pay us for doing nothing or you can pay us for working. Stop. Any way you can wrap up that investigation by tomorrow? Stop. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, I don't think he was looking for any sort of uh, in-depth investigation to begin with. I say we uh, take a uh, the old college try all day tomorrow, unless we find any other reason to uh, go elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. Well, Does it be all right with that? And then give him his all clear if we find nothing. Yeah. Let the uh, next poor family have to deal with it. Uh, do you want to? Uh, do you want to do uh, a day and an overnight there? That might be best, but I think we should all keep uh, an eye on one another. And if any of us begin to exhibit any sort of uh, malaise, mm -hmm. any sort of uh, signs, depending on how fast acting this is supposed to be, uh, we will then uh, get out of the house as quick as possible. Okay. And declare some sort of hazard, but not ghost related. Well, let's take a break then. So just from that cursory examination, it's in Latin. It seems to have to deal with the occult nature. And this tomb, if you do get it 
poem is not if, if you do get it translated is not likely to be a complete version of it because much of it is damaged and if you wanted to make your mythos roll you may all right yeah this isn't from studying it so you don't have to worry about mm, 33 over okay. three so yeah as far as you can tell it just looks like standard occult stuff you you don't know particularly what it is but that's what it Although, given if you had it translated, you could probably read it in a night, as much of it is diagrams and what have you. Not that I expect to get a hold of anyone tonight, but would there be a way to uh, like leave a message with, uh, I don't know, some someone who could possibly translate it? Yeah, you could send a, um, a telegram to anyone that you want, like either back at... Uh, I suppose you have ties to the Arkham University since you're okay. part of the SEU. So you might have a contact there. Or you could use somebody locally, like back at the Central Library. You'd said that you could use education to try it? There's a 1% oh. role to understand okay. Latin if you have no formal yeah. training in it. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to uh, try to reach someone back at... Uh... Arkham? Yeah, I get Arkham okay. University, I guess. Yeah, so, away okay. from the town. So, so, yeah, you can send out a telegram. Yeah, and so it will uh, be... A... If you like, you can put somebody in your person of interest that you might have in mind to do that. Like, you could say you know some professor there. Hmm. Or maybe just an uh, undergrad who could do translation for you. Uh, someone who's had to probably escort me around the grounds. Or 10 undergrads. That way you can send them pieces of it and then they don't... <laughs> no, it's <just> actually <laughs> not a bad idea. But I don't know if it has anything to do with that. So yeah. You want me to do the first aid? As well? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 93 over 50. Well, you could push it if you can think of some way to do it. But I can tell you that if you fail the next one, you'd likely cause him further harm. No. I'll uh, say it's, uh, I think it's uh, like a sprain. Um, you know, other than wrapping it up, I don't know anything else I could do for it. All right, we'll pick up uh, next time we play this. This has been a Death Watch production. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.